ब्रह्मा गुरु विष्णु गुरु देव महेश्वर गुरु रे परम ब्रह्मा तस्म श्री गुराव चिन्मया व्यात्सर्वलोक्यम सचराचर दर्शिताधुषाखाव ओम सहनाधु सहना गुणाख्यु सह वीरवाधीतमस्तुमादिशाई ओ शांति 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 सो वर् कंटिन्ुइंग आर जर्नी थ्रू द सेकेंड चैप्टर What verse are we on this evening? Thirty-seven. Thirty-seven. And Deepa, will you help us out, please? Do either of you need a book? I don't. She's got one. Okay. Vato va prapsya si swargam jitva va bhuksha se mahi dasma dutishta kaunteya. Slain, you will obtain heaven. Victorious, you will enjoy the earth. Therefore, stand up, O son of Kunti, determined to fight. And again, Krishna is teaching at three levels here: level of the body, Dharma Shastra. the level of the transmigrating soul and then the level of the self so now he steps the teaching down to the idea of if you're slain you die in this war don't worry you go to swarga you go to punya loka you go to uh, virya loka the uh, Valhalla, the place of the warriors. And if you win, you'll get glory here in the world. For that reason, fight. So again, he's trying to show him how his desire to run away from the world. is not the answer and this is an important point i can't stress this enough many people enter the spiritual life because the world doesn't work for them they don't have a good skill set and they're disappointed they are full of desire but they're not getting what they want so they practice phony renunciation sour grapes renunciation the story of the sour grapes i think it's the fox who's in the grape arbor and he's leaping up to try to get the grapes he wants the grapes but he can't reach them and then finally he gives up and walks away and says well they were probably sour anyway 
So that's phony renunciation. And this is what Arjuna has done. He's still a person full of desires. <clears throat> but he rationalizes and takes a pseudo-spirituality. How does Krishna know that it's a pseudo-spirituality? Because he keeps poking. Why this womanly behavior? This un-Aryan, unnoble. Everybody's going to think you're a wuss. Get up and fight. Few of us are willing to admit we have self-pity as a klesha. It's not very sexy. Nobody knows my troubles. <laughs> Takes virial courage. Get up, do your duty, and move. Is what you should say. Any thoughts on this? Next verse. Sukha dukhe sami kritva, lava la bhojaya jayo, tato yutaya yujyasva, neva papa mavapsyasi. Having made pleasure and pain, gain and loss, victory and defeat the same, engage in battle for the sake of battle, thus you shall not incur sin. So, what do we mean by sin? So we have to move away from the Judeo-Christian notion of it. Papam and punya are the two words. Punya is usually translated as merit. Papam as sin or demerit. I think I may have given you my definitions in this class. I'll review them. Any action, gross, meaning in the physical, or subtle, meaning a mental or emotional tendency, that purifies our inner equipment, the mind and the intellect, is punya. There's an exoteric meaning, meaning I do various rituals to accrue merit. But the purpose of it all is to move the mind towards sattva, purity. Papam, on the other hand, is any action or mode of thinking we engage in that grossifies, makes the mind more dense. Greed, anger, self-absorption. The desire for revenge, egoism, wanting to be more important than other people. Violence. These sully the mind. They get harder to do side. So here, Krishna is saying, how do we act? in the world. And he's given us one of the most important practices in the tradition. Sama Drishta. The equality of vision. Usually we look at it heat and cold in the body. Sukham Dukham Cha uh, suffering and pleasure in the mind, siddha, uh, siddha, honor and dishonor, accomplishment, failure in the intellect. We want to stand back and 
take on the viewpoint of the uninvolved, unattached witness. Sak Shiva. And endeavor to make these dwandwas, these are the pairs of opposites, the same. <clears throat> Shankara has a marvelous image. He says, have a mind like a wicker basket with water pouring through it. What we want to do is let the sense data just pass through without getting all hung up in trying to maximize the pleasure and avoid the misery. Reminds me of a very famous Zen story. So once upon a time, there were two samurai and their lords were engaged in a feudal battle. And the first samurai kill the feudal lord of the second samurai. So according to the Bushido tradition, the second samurai had to get revenge. So he chased the first samurai the length and breadth of Japan for 20 years. Finally catches up with him. All their students are around, and the two of them engage in mortal combat. And the second samurai defeats the first one, has him there on the ground, and is ready to cut his head off. And the first samurai spits in the other one's face. Second samurai stops, backs up, sheaths his sword, bows to the other samurai, and walks away. And all his students are gathering around him and they say, Master, why didn't you kill him? You finally had him. And he says, because when he spit in my face, I became angry. He had lost his samadrishta. Heat and cold, pleasure and suffering, honor and dishonor. Then act in the world according to your Duty, meaning what are your given tasks at this point in your life? Do them with integrity. Do them like that samurai. But stay detached. So if someone praises you, oh, Daniel, you've done such a marvelous job. You've saved me so much money. No one does finance like you. What do you do? You graciously say, say thank you and let it pass through. You have a student in class, they get triggered and they, you're a terrible person, you're a terrible teacher. What do you do? You let it pass through. Don't let it cook onto the ego. Now, in Viveka Chudamani, 
Shankara has this marvelous section called the qualifications of a fit student. And in the prefatory verses, he uses the word medha. The adhikari, the fit student has to be medha. Who can tell me what medha means? Memory. Having a keen memory, yes. The exoteric meaning is you ought to be able to memorize some shlokas that are helpful. No, that's very beneficial. But the deeper meaning of Veda is to remember to apply the teaching at the critical moment in our lives. That's the hard part. Be here in class, hear Gita verse. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I understand very, very true. And then someone has a scowl or an unkind word. <laughs> We let it land on the eagle instead of just we let it pass through. Now, here's another secret most of us are more than willing to try to renounce our attachment to the negative stuff when it comes to us. Oh, I got so triggered with that. I'm trying to let it go and I'm having a hard time. And I'll tell you the secret. What usually has happened is we've gotten identified on the positive side. Oh, I love you so much. You make me so happy. There's no one who's as good and kind to me as you. What does our ego want to do? <laughs> and then the next week, you've hurt my feelings. How could you say that to me? We can't let it go. So the hard part is when the positive ego strokes come. Let the pleasurable experiences happen. Let it pass through. Let it pass through. Have a mind like a sieve with just water pouring. This is the key to the practice of Sama Drishta, this equality of vision. Then do as you will, act according to what circumstances present to you. Any questions about this practice? I have a question. Please. Um, last week you had spoke a little bit about a quote from Carl Jung about like only a healthy ego can die. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about how that works along with this? This is a more advanced practice. So when a person has been able to get some degree of self-esteem, and again, I like to say, if you want self-esteem, try doing esteemable acts. But that only takes us so far. Then what we need to do is start letting go of our identification. Both the positive and the negative information that comes from the world. This is a little more advanced practice. Does that make it a little clear, Ashley? 
It does. Let me see if I can get an example. No, that won't work. Just sit with that. Sit with that. So this is, again, chapter two is what I call the table of contents chapter. It briefly talks about all the major ideas that will be covered in depth as we go through the rest of the book. So if you have a doubt about an idea, just set it on the shelf for now. And as we make our way through the text, it will become clear. All right, any other questions about Samadrishta as a practice? Next verse. Isha te bihata samke buddhi yogit tvamam shrunu buddhaya yukto yaya patha karma buddhaya yukto yaya patha karma bandha prahasyasi This which has been taught to thee is wisdom concerning Sankhya. Now listen to the wisdom concerning yoga. Having known which, O Partha, you shall cast off the bonds of action. So, this again is a technical language used in Gita. So let's, let's talk a little bit about it. First of all, Vyasa, our poet, uses the word yoga in an incredibly broad sense. In fact, every single chapter is entitled the yoga of yada, 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 yada. Yoga simply means union. Now, the word Sankhya here is an old word. It means knowledge here. So now he's given uh, Arjuna the teaching on knowledge. When he uses here the word yoga, what he's going to be referring to is action, karma, yoga. What are the actions? How can I use my actions as a way Purify the head and the heart. Again, one of the things that's unique about Gita, older texts like most of the Upanishads, they're tailored for people who are living the life of a renunciate largely. Gita is tailored for the active person in the world. Swamiji used to say, the man of knowledge downtown. Nowadays, we can say, the person of knowledge downtown. We have women in executive positions. All right, going on. Neha Vikramana Shoshasti Pratyavayo Nat Vidyate Swalpa Mapyasya Bhatarmasya Trayate Mahatobhayat. In this there is no loss of effort, nor is there any harm or production of contrary results. Even a little of this knowledge, even a little practice of the yoga, protects one from the great fear. This is one of my favorite verses. So this tradition is not about, oh, I'm going to go through a whole bunch of suffering here and now so that after I die, I can go to heaven or get moksha or something like that. 
I had a boss, a priest, when I was uh, a working church musician. And he said the most revealing thing, when I die, if there's no heaven, I'm going to be really pissed. <laughs> because he had lived a life uh, of self-denial. My suspicion is it was self-denial. I don't think he had the tools to give up desire. Most Christianity has no frame for that. But if he was a goody-goody, when he went to heaven, it'd all be very good. That's not the viewpoint of yoga or of sadhya, of this tradition. What Krishna says here is, it is the most practical way to live in this world. This is it. My personal view, take the position that it's going to be just like this for the rest of eternity. If that be so, then how can you and I be happy in this very world? with the politics, with the economy, with the people, with everything in it. What we find is just a little bit of this practice yields enormous results. It frees us from a lot of fear. Just taking the last verse. If we begin to practice a little bit of detachment, learning to stand back, endeavoring to witness our interior experience rather than get caught up in it, understanding whatever's going on don't worry this too will pass mind states are not eternal they're all temporary if we begin to identify as sakshi the witness we don't get as involved in the various perturbations. Even a little of this starts to bring us some peace. Even when the mind is crazy, well, I'm not going to believe it. Try to practice in Samadrishta. Watch. Circumstances are terrible. My boss yelled, well, can I practice a little bit of this equality of vision? Right away, we begin to get some serenity. Here's a very important tool. Make peace of mind your most prized possession. I have a friend that just had a fire in his apartment. Ceiling, stuff like that. So he had to get out right away. So most of us would grab what was of value and 
dash out the door, what would you grab? What's important to you? Would it be your laptop? Would it be some jewelry? Would it be letters? Would it be your murti, your beautiful shiva? What would you take if your house was on fire? And what Gita is saying here is make peace of mind your most prized possession. Don't squander it on an unkind word or a scowl or a poor performance either of yourself or others. Nothing in life is important enough for me to lose my serenity. And that, in many ways, is a decision. I have a new set of values. All of a sudden, we start to have what the master called the peace that passes all understanding. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. I'm in the world, but not in Any thoughts on this? Next verse. Vyavasayatmika buddhir Ekeha Guru Nandana Bahu Bahushaka Hanantasha Uttayo Vyavasadhina. Here, O joy of the Gurus, Guru Nandana, there is but a single pointed determination. Many branched and endless are the thoughts of the irresolute. So this stepping back, this practice of samadrishta starts to allow the mind to come to a single point. There's a deeper meaning here. If you are like most of us, What I want is a good job. What I want is a good relationship. What I want is some money in the bank. What I want is a nice home, a nice uh, car. Uh, I want health. And I'm kind of agitated and upset. And therapy isn't working that well. So maybe if I start meditation, that might help. So the spiritual life becomes another band-aid to put on my ulcerated mind so I can get about the business of having a successful life. No blame. That's how most of us start. But if we keep on the path, at some point, Everything goes like this. And we see, oh, it's not all about how can I maximize cash and prizes. It's about knowing God aright, knowing the self, moksha. And then my job, my relationship, my home, my bank account are what Ram Das called grist for the mill, meaning that's where I work out my clashes, my afflictions, my defilements, the things that 
keep me from yoga. Once we see that that's the purpose of life, is our consciousness. Then we get single pointed on that. Everything in life becomes a tool for me. Let me give you a personal example. I had begun to notice that impatience had started to arise in my mind in a way. I just didn't want to have that as a play show. When's they're going to show up, you know, and when's such and such going to happen? Looking at my watch, checking the time. So I'm just going to take on the practice when that desire to know how much longer something's going to be or when will the person supposedly come. No, I'm just not going to indulge in that. It arises. I see you for what you are. And I'm going to let you go. I'm in Nityananda, eternal timeless bliss. Let it go. Tiny little glacier. But why not? Why not? Go. Let it go. So a simple thing like waiting for my friend today to meet me down front to go to the bar to go to the symphony. He was three minutes late. But I got to watch that. See, well, I, I don't want to be ruled by that agitation. It became risk for the mill. It became an opportunity to practice. And once we see that that's the goal, that everything in life becomes useful. I was talking with a friend and he finds that when he uh, goes to family events, he has an older brother who's funny and an extrovert and the center of attention and in the past, when he's gone to these events, he comes out feeling like he's a total loser and wants to jump off the bridge. And avoiding these events is not a solution. He's got family duties. Thanksgiving's going to come up. So our conversation today is, okay, what's your strategy going to be? Your older brother is guru. He's going to be funny and entertaining, and you're not your brother. How can you be at this dinner party? And serenity. There's an opportunity for practice. Something as simple as Thanksgiving with your family. Does anybody have any questions about this principle? It's really, really important. may have had strong feelings about the election. Can you be in acceptance? 
Doesn't mean you have to like it, just means it's the acknowledgement of the material fact. And you be solution oriented. Trash talking and worry is not a solution for anything. Everything becomes a possibility to do yoga. Not to get anything out of the world, just that it moves us into a place where our serenity becomes the background of everything. Any thoughts on this? Well, don't I have a right to be angry if someone cheats me? You do whatever you want. There are no rules. Do you like how it feels? No. We have some tools. All right, next verse. Checking my watch to see if much more time we have. Pardon me? Nothing. Kama, mana, swarga, para, janma, karma, falak, pradam, kriya, vishesha, bahulam. There's two together. Okay. Full of desires, having heaven as their goal, they utter flowery words which promise new birth as the reward for their actions and prescribe various specific actions for the attainment of pleasure and lordship. For those who cling to joy and lordship, whose minds are drawn away by such teaching, are neither determinate and resolute, nor are they fit for steady meditation and samadhi. Yes. So, we have two ways of approaching the world. Everybody wants happiness, but you can be a bogey or you can be a yogi. A bogey practices boga enjoyment, a yogi practices yoga. What is the frame of life for a bogey? If I satisfy as many desires as possible, I'll be happy. Now, Let's talk a little bit about why this doesn't work. When desire and object of desire become one, satisfy a desire, what actually happens is for a moment, the mind is free from its restlessness, its discontent. And if I attribute the joy, the happiness, to the person, place, thing, or situation, and I have after the fact thinking about it, chintya. Chintya in Hindi means worry. But in Sanskrit, it means after the fact mental rumination. 
over an experience. Oh, that was so fabulous. Let's do it again. It sows a vasana. A vasana is an impression left in the unconscious as the result of previously performed egoistic actions. This understanding of vasana is critical to understanding why we do what we do in the practice. So, if I have a period of indulgence where I have egoistic revelry with the objects of the senses, I'm all caught up in I-ness and minus. Then at a future time, those vasanas will sprout as restlessness and discontent. So many beginning students. Did you meditate this week? Oh, Jim, I, I wanted to, but I, I, just, I just couldn't get to it. I was just too busy. And then when I would sit down, my mind was just going everywhere. I just, I just, I don't know whether meditation is for me. Any of you had friends who said that? Yes, no? Friends, past selves. What is that feeling? It's a spiritual hangover is what it is. If you go out with some friends and you drink cheap champagne on Friday night and you wake up Saturday morning with a headache, And you foolishly think, oh, I must be coming down with the flu. You're an idiot. You're hungover. You have alcohol poisoning, literally, to a small degree. That's what a hangover is. It's too late. You already drank the champagne. So when I indiscriminately revel with the objects of the senses and at a later time I'm restless and irritable and discontent and angry and controlling and depressed, vengeful, jealous, That's a spiritual hangover. The cause is yesterday's indiscriminate revelry with the objects of the senses. That's its cause. So it's so important to see that's the result of the life of indulgence. And if we keep at it enough, then you find we may have friends who are addicts and alcoholics. The addict and the alcoholic have lost the capacity of choice. They can't help themselves. They're under the throes of compulsion. And if they don't have their substance, they start to detox and it's incredibly painful. physically but psychologically that's just a socially inappropriate form of the human condition that's all it is the bogey has an addictive relationship with life and after the fact 
the mind goes through withdrawals. Oh, I want, I want, I want. Oh, I'm so lonely. I want a partner. And the therapist says, well, everybody wants that. That's just natural. Oh, I'm not making enough money. All my friends have big houses and vacations. We're caught in vancha, wanting, spriha, thirsting. No, spriha is longing. Krishna, thirsting. It hurts. So the more you get, the more you want. And I love what Swamiji used to say. If sex were satisfying, you'd only do it once. That's only a metaphor for everything. Now, the yogi also wants happiness. But the yogi, understanding the relationship between desire and suffering, this whole phenomena, phenomenon of vasana, creation, begins to engage in a way of life that reduces the number of desires attained. Let me give you a very graphic example. There are those people who try to quit drinking out of willpower. They call it white knuckling. The desire is still there. And they're Unhappy, miserable, angry people and their friends say, for God's sake, have a drink. You're making the rest of us miserable. Then there are those people who enter into a way of life where they have a spiritual program. And what happens? The desire to drink and use is taken away. And what are they left with? Freedom! That's the culture today. Right here, right now, in this very body. So, this verse, Krishna is saying, this is not a moral issue. This invites us to be spiritual scientists. Perform the experiments that the path suggests and see if it doesn't improve the quality of your life right here, right now. I'm unhappy. I'm not getting what I want. No, you're unhappy because you're stuck wanting. It's the wanting itself that hurts. Getting what you want as a means to try to deal with your unhappiness is like pouring fuel on the fire, thinking that's going to satisfy the fire. Put it out. What happens when you put more fuel on the fire? It just gets bigger.
So there was no more fruitful meditation than to stand back, watch our minds. What does it feel like to want something you don't have? It sucks. The more I want it, more important it is to me, the further away it seems to be, the more unhappy I am. Desire and object of desire become one temporarily. The craving is gone. But if we live that extroverted life, another desire arises from And that's the tyranny of the extroverted mind. No peace. Constantly running around. And everything in American culture, I don't know about Germany, American culture, all the advertising, all the media, all the TV programs. Get more stuff, get more stuff. But with most toys wins, power, prestige, control, limousines, bling. <laughs> it, went like nuts. it went like to a thousand, something like that. Uh, I missed out, I didn't buy it up. It's crazy. Any other thoughts on this? Yoga and yoga. And what I like to do is like pay attention to just some everyday things. In the Bay Area, we deal with traffic. So there you are on the freeway and you need to be someplace. You said you'd be there by four o'clock and the traffic is backed up. And here you are gripping the steering wheel, trying to push the car with your heart. <gasps> Any of you ever done that? Yes, no? Mm -hmm. And then you finally go, I'll get there when I get there. And you let it go. Get out your phone, send the text. Caught in traffic, I'll be there when I get there. Now, did you change the worldly circumstance? No. What did you do? You dropped the Buddha. Maybe get some serenity. Even a little of this knowledge freezes from great fear. This is important. Good stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff. It's all small stuff. How do I get rid of my worries? Quit worrying. All gonna work out. Raja Yoga tradition, Ishwara Pranidhana. What's that mean? Surrender to God. Yes, trustful surrender to God. Let it go.
such is the power of Maya. And this, I'll be happy when, it'll be better if, or better different. Even though I hear this truth so many times, so much easier to say, come to satsang and they leave the Vedanta on their asana and walk on the floor. All right. Next one. Tregunya Vishaya Vida Nistregunya Bavarjuna Nirdwandu Nitya Satvasto Nir Yoga Kshema Atmavan. This is another one of my favorites. Please, the English. The Vedas deal with the three attributes. Be you above those three attributes or gunas. O Arjuna, free yourself from the pairs of opposites and ever remain in the sattva, freed from all thoughts of acquisition and preservation, and be established in the self. Yes. So here, again, we're changing subjects because this is the table of contents. One, he's now going into the teaching of the three gunas. Guna in Sanskrit is a pun. It means the three great qualities, Thomas Rajas and Sattva, but also means rope. It's one of the words for rope. So we are bound by the gunas, like bound by a rope. Ha ha ha, it's a pun. Okay, so what are the gunas? Thomas Rajas Sattva. Thomas, the principle of inactivity. Dullness, delusion, illusion, lethargy, depression, the desire for unconsciousness. Rajas, the principle of activity. Doing things, achieving things, acquiring things, accomplishing things. Actually, the vast majority of our suffering is in the rajasic mind state. Because there's where we get disappointment, ambition, competition, jealousy, envy, etc. All having to do with activity and the success and failure of it. Sattva, the principle of knowledge. And I've given up the need to do anything to be happy. Given up what we call karitavya, obligatory action. I, I'll be happy when, it'll be better with. And the best way to understand it, I like to use pizza as an example. So I'm hanging out at the house all of a sudden, I'm getting really hungry because of the force of the past. I'm thinking, pizza. What's the best pizza around here now? I don't even know anymore. Don't get pizza. No, I don't eat cheese, but I just have Zachary's. Zachary's pizza. Oh, Zachary's pizza. Now I'm in the state of a Rajas. So what do I do? Hello, I'm Ida. 
vegetable pizza delivered, blah, 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 blah. How long will it be? 45 minutes, my God. So hungry, I really want this pizza. The Rajas. 55 minutes later. Ding ding. Pizza's come. Well, thank you. Finally, it's here. Open the box. Pour half the pizza piece out. Oh, it's hot. Oh, man, is that good. Sabra. And I eat half the box. And what happens? Pizza coma. Dumbass. And after pizza coma for 20 minutes, Ice cream. <laughs> Old thing starts over again. So the mind cycles through Rajas, Sakura, Dumbass, Rajas, Sakura, Dumbass. So what? Krishna is saying here is step back and watch the mind. And it'll be larger movements. You may wake up in the morning and your mind is just funky. And you're not feeling well or you're low energy. The mind is tomasic that day. Stand back. Just watch it. Or sometimes, you know, just doing, 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 doing. No playing, just watch it. Other times you may have, oh, my mind is able to be blissful easily without effort. Soft. But it seems contradictory. Be you beyond the gunas. Be gunaihi. And then he turns around and says, and ever remain in the sattvic state. Now you just told me to be beyond the gunas. Now you're telling me to be in one of the gunas? The sattvic mind is the happiest mind. So the yogi learns to Cultivate sattva, not because you get a gold star for being virtuous, but a sattvic mind is the happiest mind, not the rajasic mind. The rajasic mind is a pain. Swamiji used to talk about America may have a higher standard of living. We've got cars and plumbing and electricity and cell phones and stuff. But do we have a higher standard of life? When I was younger, labor unions worked very hard to gain the 40 hour work week for people who have jobs. After 2008, when so many people were laid off, many, many businesses said, this is our advantage. Now we're gonna take salaried employees and make them work 60 hours a week and pay them the same. It's all right. There are people lined up to get a job. If you don't like it, the door is out there. How many friends do you know who are climbing the corporate ladder? 
especially in IT, who work 60, 70 hours a week. quality of life has diminished. Now, antithetically, in Germany, how many weeks of paid vacation do most people get? Oh, I want to know, to be honest. I, I know in, in Scandinavia, four, it's usually about six weeks. Four or five. Yeah. Could you take five weeks of paid vacation where you are? Not consecutively, no. Yeah. And is health care a privilege or a right in Germany? A right. Yeah. How many of us know people here in America with huge student loan debt because of a college education? If you pass the exams and you can get into a good college, what's it cost you in Germany? It's free. What? It's free. Oh my God! <laughs> Standard of life. Values are different. These are just some simple worldly examples. Swamiji used to say, India is importing the worst of America. It's greed and materialistic values. And it's exporting its best, meaning its spirituality. And he used to say, if you're not careful, this is to the Indians, one of these days you're going to have to Learn your Vedanta from Swami Bill and Swami Steve because you've lost touch with your own cultural heritage. So these two paths, Olga and Yoga. How should we live in the world? Stand back. Practice Sakshi Bhava, attitude of the witness. Endeavor to practice Sama Drishta, equality of mind in heat and cold, pleasure and suffering, honor and dishonor. Those are catch alls for everything. If I want to be happy, how do I do that? Maximize clarity, a peaceful mind, a mind free from the agitations of craving. And this is the mind that's most suited for self-realization. That's how he ends this class. All right, we've gone over. I'm sorry, but um, I did. <laughs> so this is our last class of the year. We're taking every uh, all of December off, and we will start up Gita again on January 5th. So mark your calendars. Om Pur Namada Pur Namidam Pur Nat Pur Namudachate Pur Nasya Pur Namadaya Pur Nameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 
Om 